Subhanallah, this morning I stopped for my morning coffee uh, usually at a petrol station and I know the owner that works there. Subhanallah, I noticed the last couple of times I've seen him, he's a completely changed man. He was quite wealthy, driving fancy cars, and we would always talk about the next fancy car he was going to buy and so on. Lately, he's been very quiet, very quiet, very quiet. And I approached him today and I started speaking to him and I said, what's, what's the matter? You're not your usual self. How's the AMG? And he said, oh, I don't care about that stuff anymore. I said, why, what's the matter? He said, you, did you notice that I wasn't here at work for a few months? I said, yeah, I noticed. I didn't see you for a while. I thought you were away on holiday or something. He goes, no. I was standing on the roof of my house. And I fell off the roof of my house and landed headfirst on the concrete. Two-story house. This man is not Muslim. And I said, are you okay? I noticed, as he said that, I noticed he was wearing a beanie. I could see with tears in his eyes, he said, Brother, if I tell you what happened to me, you won't believe me. I said, tell me. He said, I came off the roof, I landed head first, I had a brain injury. The doctors, they had to shave my head, they had to cut my scalp open, they had to take a metal power tool and cut the skull open and remove a piece of the skull to relieve the pressure on the brain. And they did everything they could do and they stitched me back together and I was in a coma. And I, the only thing keeping me alive was machines that were plugged in to help me breathe and to keep me awake. Nurses had to come and wash me. They had to feed me with tubes. And nurses had to clean me after the food was processed through my body. I was completely unable to move, unable to speak, unaware of everything. The doctors, they told my family that there was no chance that I would ever wake up. The machines were keeping me alive. And the doctors told my family that this is it. Your husband, your father, he's a vegetable now. There's too much brain damage. There's no chance that he can recover. It's impossible for him to recover. And over the course of a couple of weeks, the doctors and the nurses and the medical professionals are convincing the family that the only thing to do now is to turn off these machines. And the family is saying, what if, what about this, can we try this, why don't we wait? And the doctor is saying, there's no chance. Your husband is dead. Your father is dead. He's gone. He will never come back. And after this accident, after this brain damage, after this surgery, after being in a coma, after weeks of convincing the family that there is nothing left to do except to deactivate the machines, which means that the heart will stop beating and the soul will leave the body, they decided on a day and a time. This is a conversation I had this morning. And the family, they called the extended family, the cousins and the uncles, to come to the hospital and say their goodbyes and shed their tears and kiss him on the forehead and the kids to hug him and everything. And the day and the time was set to switch off the machines. And he's telling me the story, he says the doctors came to the room to switch the machines off with my wife with them. And as they entered the room to turn off the machines, I woke up. And I said, where am I? What's happening? The doctors were completely stunned. There are so many instances that you and I know very well where the impossible has happened. When Sayyidina Ibrahim salam, was being thrown into the fire, the impossible happened by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the fire, Kuni bardan wa salaman, be cool and safe for Prophet Ibrahim and he walked out unharmed. The impossible happened. When Sayyidina Yunus was swallowed by the whale, the impossible happened. When Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam was against the back, his back against the Red Sea and the children of Israel with him and the Fir'aun and his army closing on them and the oceans opened up to let them through. 
The impossible happened when Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam cured the blind, cured the lepers, and even resurrected the dead by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the impossible happened for this man who lives in Liverpool, who is not Muslim, who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded his soul to return to his body and he woke up moments before the machines would be switched off to end his life. And he's tearing up as he's telling me the story. Imagine how his family would have felt. Imagine his family that had already come to say their goodbyes. And already come to terms with the fact that he was going to die. And cried their tears and hugged him and kissed him and then phone calls. He's awake. Subhanallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given the man another chance and so I put my day on hold and I stood and had a conversation with him and I said why do you think this happened to you do you believe in God he said I do now but he said I'm a little bit sad I'm a little bit sad because I felt like I was going home I felt like I was going back to God back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala back to whatever term you want to use. But he sent me back here and I don't understand why. And I said, so, so if you had to guess what the reason is, you've been sent back for some reason, what do you think the reason is? He said, I think I have to be a better person than I was. I think I have to help people. I think I have to be good. I think I have to spread good karma, as he put it, being a non-Muslim in the world. And subhanallah, this conversation is a sign to any Muslim that this is a golden dawah opportunity standing in front of you. So we stood and we had a chat and I told him, gave him a piece of advice if he would accept it from me, which you should give to anyone who you feel might one day become Muslim. We all have that one non-Muslim friend with very good manners, very honest, upstanding, has integrity, has these qualities that we all admire. And maybe even sometimes we wish we knew how to speak to them about Islam, but we don't know how or what to say. Here is the simplest and easiest thing that you can say. If I may, with your permission, may I give you a piece of advice? He said, of course. I said, you believe that God exists? He said, yes. I said, keep asking him to guide you which way to go. Because still this guy could go either way. But it's a golden opportunity to speak to these kinds of people about Islam. Continue to ask Allah to guide you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is managing the da'wah chain. Whether it's a life experience, whether it's a YouTube video, whether it's a billboard, whether it's a friend that they know, whether it's a pamphlet, whether it's a book, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is managing all those interactions for all of those people to come step by step closer to Islam. And I'll share with you my plan for this guy who inshallah, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide him to Islam. Inshallah, say Ameen. I'm going to put in his details and the street address of this petrol station and I'm going to send him a Quran. And I'm not accountable or responsible for whether or not he believes or even whether or not he reads it. But when we hear things like this in conversation, someone who was close to death, someone who's rethinking their purpose, someone who's, who's c considering what are we here for. And the way this man was speaking today, he was speaking as if he was a Muslim. He said, brother, I'm 40 years old. All the things I have accumulated, cars and money and houses and whatever it is, it's going to be not even another 40 years and I will be dead. I came this close to death this year, but there's going to come a time. There's going to come a stage where I reach all the way to death. So all these things that you and I used to talk about before, I can't even bring myself to think about these things. And he said, it's worrying my wife. My wife, she said, you're so different now. You're talking different, acting different. And you can see on his face as he's stacking the shelves, he's not really focusing on what he's doing. He's thinking about why am I here? 
Why am I still alive? Why do I exist? Why has God sent me back here? And he's exploring and learning and finding and seeking. And I hope he takes that advice and asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide him to Islam. My brothers in Islam, we are, we are 1.8 billion. The da'wah we can do, the da'wah that we are capable of doing is phenomenal, is immeasurable. And the people that don't know what we know, wallahi they are lost. They don't know how to make sujood and feel that comfort in sujood. They don't know how to say what we say 17 times a day. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Maliki Yawm Al-Deen. Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'een. Ihdina Sirat Al-Mustaqeem. Sirat Al-Ladheena An'amta Alayhim. غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين يا الله these words are a treasure from the treasures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they don't know them but you know and I know and we owe it to them and we owe it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to share what we know with them my dear brothers in Islam Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said that the heaviest thing in the scales on the day of judgment is not your salah, is not your siyam, is not your zakat, is not your sadaqah, but the heaviest thing on the scale on the day of judgment is good character, or we can say good manners. And I'll go further as to say that Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he cared about how people felt. And I'll go even further as to say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cares about how people feel. I'm talking about people's feelings. We concentrate often in Islam on the mechanics of the worship that we do. It means we concentrate on the salah. We concentrate on the siyam. We concentrate on calculating the 2.5%, which is all good. These are all good things. But something happens to us and we transform. We change when we're doing business with people. When there's a transaction happening. When money becomes involved. When someone becomes an employee of someone else. For some reason, when these things enter into the picture, everything we know about Islam and manners and kindness and compassion flies out the window. And wallahi, I don't understand it. And I've heard Muslims say to me, no, 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 brother, don't bring Islam into this. This is business. How dare they? Say that when it comes to business, Allah doesn't apply. When it comes to money, Allah doesn't apply. When it comes to profit, Allah doesn't apply. When it comes to anything, Allah doesn't apply. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His regulations and His mercy of giving us those lessons and regulations applies to every part of your life. Wallahi, it applies to how you relieve yourself in the restroom. Wallahi, it applies to how you are intimate with your spouse. So who are you to say that my preferences go above Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's commands because money is involved, because business is involved, because partnership is involved? Wallahi, if these words have left your mouth, you don't understand the seriousness of what you are saying. You should say, Ya Allah, I don't know what I was thinking. Forgive me for my ignorance in making such a statement. We are the nation of people who have submitted to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in every part of our life. And I'm speaking here to the business owners and to the managers. I'm speaking here to the Amirs and the head of the Shura and the chairman of the board and the CEOs and the general managers. I'm speaking to you. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was so kind with his companions that every single one of them would have sworn that they were his favorite. 
Even in Medina, there was an old woman who used to come and sweep the masjid. One day he noticed that she wasn't there. They said she passed away, she died. He said, why didn't anyone tell me so that I could pray janazah over this woman? Don't think that because you pay someone a paycheck that they are beneath you. I know that's the way the world works. But you have to remember that Islam came to teach the human beings the way the world should work. 